Hello, and welcome back to the Sitting In podcast. I am Jack, I am your host today, and your only host, in fact. If you've never heard or listened to Sitting In before, usually I have two other hosts with me, Callum and Reese, but they're both away doing extracurricular activities or whatever. I have no idea, so you have to contend with my slightly nasal, um, hopefully interesting voice today. Before we start, I just want to say that I'm I'm already pretty caffeinated on the bean juice already, but if you'd like to support the podcast and support us in any kind of way, we have a link below for Buy Me A Coffee, as well as our merch store. We can get these cool these cool uniforms, these cool outfits. We have, we have all kinds of stuff, and we've got some new ideas for stuff as well, so keep an eye out for that. As well, if you want to share the podcast in any kind of way, that would be super beneficial to us as well. It really, it really does help kind of drive audience engagement. And of course, we'd like to hear from you. So if you want to drop a comment below, if you, I don't know, want to comment on my resemblance to Paul McCartney, that's completely up to you, but do it in the comment section. So without further ado, let's kick it off. So this week, I kind of asked for some questions and topics to look at um, just through Instagram. And I got a really interesting range of, of, of topics to kind of talk about. So I'm a little bit nervous because I know that I'm, I'm sort of having a bit of a conversation with myself. But you know what? I'm, I'm taking it as it comes. So let's kick it off then. So the first question I got or the first topic, should I say, that I got is counterpoint. Now, this kind of seems something that uh, <laughs> has followed me around for a while. It's something I've studied quite a lot being a classical guitar player. Um, and it seems like something that comes up in a lot of my lessons as well. It's, it's something that people kind of ask me. So for those that don't really know about counterpoint, counterpoint is really about two uh, melodies or two lines of music that, that converge into one or that kind of talk to each other, if you like. I, I think of counterpoint really as like a, as a conversation among uh, melodies in that kind of way. And like any good conversation, there is some kind of relation, whether that's an imitation or it's in um, kind of playing in parallel or whatever it may be. So counterpoint is really useful. Um, yeah, on this topic, then it's a funny one. So I was trying to think like, how should I take this? It's quite a, quite an interesting one. A lot of people hear of the word counterpoint or you know that sort of thing, like contrapuntal music as well, is another another term that's used. And they often think about this music coming from like Bach and the Renaissance era, so back in like the 15, 1600s, so 17th century. Funny how that works. But they often kind of use that word to describe how a lot of the music back then was written. So when you're thinking about fugues and that sort of thing. But for me, it's always been about relating it to the music of now. And I think a really great parallel that you can draw from uh, a lot of the Baroque counterpoint music and the music of today is this idea that harmony can be created and, and simulated, I suppose, by how melodies move and how they change and how they're characterized by their relationships with other melodies as well. So, yeah, it's an interesting one talking about counterpoint because there's such a there's such a massive world of, of what it really means. But yeah, for me, it's um, it's always been interesting looking at, say, two notes that sit side by side each other and how even just changing one of those notes changes the relationship between both of them. If you were to add in a third note, you add in another context, another character, as it were, or a motif. And again, yeah, that uh, that that overall kind of harmonic texture changes and it's uh, it's really never ending. And for anybody that's never tried it and specifically talking about guitar players, because we are we're known for being sort of very chordal or melody based. So one of the two, really. Um, but I think for guitar players, there's a really kind of cool exercise that really got me going with counterpoint, was, which is to take two melodies and try to hear them as both having starting points. So they are both beginning somewhere in a tune. So your, let's say your top melody, you've got a top melody that sits maybe on E. Let's say we're in the key of C. And um, we could talk modally as well as E is starting on E Phrygian. But really, I'm thinking about this more conceptually. I'm thinking about this top note of E starting my melodic line. So the way that I start of the way the way that I sort of kind of compose it and, and improvise it is by imagining that this this melody that starts on E starts to have a life of its own, really. And what kind of happens below is we have let's say we have a let's say we have a melody on C because we're in the key of we're in the key of C. Now this melody on C might happen an octave below or two octaves below or whatever it may be. And so that melody on C is going to have a life of its own and it's going to move perhaps in the opposite direction. It might even move by different intervals. But when we start kind of thinking differently about how notes move instead of chords, it gets us into a new place with both improvising and thinking about, um, I would kind of say like uh, melodic development as well. It's quite interesting to see. So you can vary things with rhythm. You can vary things with uh, note spacing as well. 
Uh, you can even add in kind of an extra note to characterize that sound that you're going for. But yeah, counterpoint is a really big subject as well. It's a, it's a lot of fun to really dig into. And it's cool to hear it in different iterations now as well. But it does seem like something that is, I suppose, nestled in classical music tradition, really, when we talk about what counterpoint is. But yeah, you can find counterpoint anywhere, really. Um, I suppose, you know, the first thing that comes to mind as well is for people who know him as a jazz guitarist called Bruce Foreman. Bruce Foreman has some really great counterpoint lines going on in his in his pieces of music. Uh, they're really worth checking out. They're really cool. So moving on then. So you're going to see me kind of jump between a lot of different topics today, uh, which is kind of the goal, to be honest with you. I'm keeping all these anonymous as well, if you're wondering. Some of the names, I have to be honest and say, I can't pronounce, whether it's a name that you've chosen or a bunch of numbers. It's, it's very difficult to... Very difficult to know. So moving on to another question I've got here. How do you actually improve technique? This is a great question. This is this is a question I come up against quite a lot. And I actually find this one really hard. I'd love to be able to answer this as well. I sit down with, you know, a hybrid picking book exercise and just go through the whole thing for, you know, however many hours or, or, or weeks. But for me, at least, my experience of improving technique specifically for me like hybrid picking or alternate picking I was given like very little direction with a lot of my technique when I was learning and so I think a lot of my own uh, technique development came from just imagining how I would go and do something so a lot of the time like I'd be transcribing piano I really love kind of piano voicings um, which of course have a big range as well so if you're covering say like the sixth string the fifth string the fourth string and then maybe the first string you have this sort of awkward two note jump between those two strings. And so it kind of means that we can't silence those two notes without having this very abrasive clicking sound of, 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 of what it sounds like to, to, to obviously silence those two notes. So for me, like I kind of developed this weird, um, this weird hybrid picking technique from that. And off the back of that then, as a, as, a, as a bit of an answer to developing technique, I think there's kind of two ways to go about it. My way was very like, I suppose conceptual again, it was it was about trying to hear how something would translate to the guitar and then just giving it a go. And I know there's there's quite a lot of guitar players as well who they don't necessarily sit down to do technical practices. It is simply about just playing other people's music and trying to trying to meet your imagination and your curiosity by simply trial and error. It really is a, a lot to do with that, I would say. And going back to obviously the counterpoint stuff as well, which is something I'm super passionate about, that was also really birthed and, um, from just the idea of kind of exploring these things and, and, and seeing if they were possible rather than thinking about the technical side of things. So I don't know, there, there's maybe something in there, but the other school of thought really is that you can, you can sit and work with a lot of this stuff as well. You can sit and work on rhythmic subdivisions if that's kind of what you're interested in. You can work on um, hybrid picking techniques as well. There's a lot of really good like right hand classical guitar stuff that can be applied to hybrid picking as well. So your your pick kind of works as the the bass note or your thumb essentially and your your kind of other two or three fingers depending uh, work as your 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 kind of melodic upper melodic um, notes I suppose. But yeah, it's 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 a tough one to answer because I think you have to know why you're training technique in the first place. If you're training technique to get to, I don't know, a certain level of mastery, which is playing super fast music, then yeah, there's there's a there's a reason to kind of practice with the metronome. There's, there's a reason to look into like Troy Grady's stuff, which I think is brilliant. It's mind blowingly good, in fact, where he takes players like Frank Gambale and you know all kinds of incredible players and really breaks down the physics of how they play. I think there's a lot in there um, from Cracking the Code by by uh, Troy Grady. I think a lot of people are starting to really wake up to now and, and, and understand it's such a great resource. But yeah, I, I don't want to go too much further into that as well because then it becomes very, very guitar centric as well. And I also feel I, I sort of lose my ground a little bit with this. But yeah, small steps. So on to our next question. What do we have here? Best piece of advice that a teacher has given you? Ooh, that's a That's a really good question. Um, okay. Almost immediately, I, so when I was about 14 or 15, I started taking jazz guitar lessons. And I took jazz guitar lessons from this, this French player who is an extraordinary player. And after my lessons had finished, I actually ended up moving away, but after my lessons had finished, 
I remember after our very last lesson, he gave me a piece of advice, which I have to say has rung true ever since. And it's been like, it's been like 10 years now. Um, but it's a really good piece of advice. He said, when you stop listening to music, you die as a musician, which I mean was really stark when you're like 14 or 15 and you hear it and you're like, whoa. <laughs> but it was a really good piece of advice. It was saying that you always need to keep your ears informed, keep them up to date and, you know, essentially have your ear to the ground with a lot of this stuff as well. You learn best as well when your ear is constantly navigating new music or trying to kind of put labels to things or spot patterns as well. Um, and I think it's also, it's it's an answer for a lot of people as well. It's like, well, where do I go? Or I'm lacking inspiration or I don't feel like playing or I don't know what to work on. It's a really, it's a really good piece of advice, which is go and listen to things or go and educate your ear or simply, yeah, just listen to more. I think... Um, especially for something as complex as jazz or classical music, which really requires that active listening side of your ear, there can really never be enough listening. And in fact, it it, it cultures your ear or, or educates, I should say, it educates your, your, your ear to the music that you're trying to replicate or that you're trying to, to learn and that kind of thing as well. So it's always good to do as well. You never want to rest and, and, and be listening to the same stuff. You want to add something kind of new into the mix. So that would be the best piece of advice. But, you know, I'm, I'm also interested as well. For anybody that's listening, what is the best piece of advice that you have received from a teacher as well? Whether that's 10 years ago or maybe it was last week. And it can be to do with anything. It could be to do with keeping your left hand close to the frets. Whatever it is. I would love to hear what it is that's, that's, that's been a real eye-opener for you. So, on to the next one. Wow, we're, we're, we're zipping through these. But they're really great questions. I'm learning piano and guitar at the same time. Is this a good idea? That's another, that's another great question. These, these are really kind of making me think um, about how to kind of tackle them as well. So I don't play any piano at all, I have to say. I can sit there and sort of figure out like C major and then E minor, that kind of thing. But really, I, I don't have any training in the piano, that kind of thing. But my approach to the guitar, I would say, is very influenced by how the piano works. And I would say that especially for like uh, instrumental players who perhaps maybe they play like the, the trumpet, you often see them pairing it with playing the piano. Some obviously play the guitar as well. And it gives you this sort of best of both worlds scenario, which is quite nice. So I know that, for example, Miles Davis and Dizzy Gillespie were two horn players that both played the piano to some degree. Uh, I, I'm not sure they ever performed playing them, but I know that behind the scenes from documentaries and that kind of thing, they always had another instrument sort of going in their, in their backlog of things. It gives you a really good uh, or a different understanding of whether it's harmony or melody or rhythm as well. There's quite a few guitar players as well that have even just a basic handle on the drums, which is a really good thing. And what it teaches you as, as a guitar player is really great as well. It teaches you about rhythm, how to feel things, how to sort of cordon off different areas of your ability to be able to... Um, to be able to think and yeah, it, it, I think there's a big, big side of that as well. On the piano though, I would say that that's, that's something that I've kind of strived towards as well. Again, I don't play any piano, but conceptually the way that pianists typically use two hands equal, in equal measure at least, is kind of the way I've tried to approach the guitar with, with having kind of both hands working in that way as well. So I think it's a really great thing to be able to use both instruments as well. Um, but yeah, you may end up coming up, up with some struggles. You might see some limitations for both of these instruments. Like I know that we've talked about this in past episodes with the limitations perhaps of the guitar or the limitations of the piano in terms of whether it's tonality or performance or simply taking it to a gig, whatever it is. But if perhaps you're looking for like more work as well in the future, you'll find that you'll get plenty more if people know you as, as a multi-instrumentalist as well. There's some really great multi-instrumentalists as well that they don't seem to have compromised on one instrument so that they can kind of service the other. They seem to be able to balance them quite well. So yeah, as, as long as you can kind of do them both in equal measure and, and see that, I think what you do see with guitar players especially, and I'm saying this kind of from the perspective of a piano player or any other kind of instrumentalist learning the guitar, is you see how many cost-cutting cost cutting that's not quite the way quite the right word um corner cutting there we go there's the word corner cutting mechanisms that we have on the instrument to really uh, help us either get through harmony either with drop voicings or that sort of thing or to do with range or or whatever it may be but we we use a lot of 
funny little principles. And I draw this, I draw this idea quite a lot of like when we look at the guitar just at the fretboard, it doesn't tell us anything about the theory. It doesn't tell us where the high notes are and the low notes are. It doesn't tell us where middle C is. It doesn't tell us what a semitone looks like. Uh, we obviously don't know anything about like the major third jump that happens between that that B and or G and B string. There we go. Funny morning, eh? So we don't really know a lot of that stuff just looking at the guitar. And so I think over time, what's happened is a you know educational guitar culture or whatever you want to call it. The history of guitar education has always been about trying to define some. Um, cornerstones that really are, are, are cost, I keep saying cost cutting, but what I mean is corner cutting. There we go. Defining some cornerstones that are built on corner cutting, really. So whether that's like, um, I think tablature is one of those things. It's really, it's really great for being able to create our own notation system that's specific. Because of course, again, one thing that we can do is we can play the same note in a million different ways or maybe five, maybe not a million. We can play the same note in five different ways in the same pitch register as well. And it can it can throw up some problems as well, especially for like sight reading musicians. So yeah, we do have a few corner cutting mechanisms that you start to see when you come from another place as a musician. Um, so yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting world to inhabit. But just as well, I think it's great to be able to think from the perspective of different musicians. I think it's that's that's ultimately kind of why we do what we do it's it's about perspective building and being able to think creatively by changing our mind or thinking from other people's perspective as well so it's really good but on that topic i would say that it's also really useful for you if you are a piano player a trumpet player a guitar player to transcribe other instruments as well other instruments and you notice this especially again kind of going back into the jazz realm you notice this so much when you transcribe horn lines for guitar players at least it's really strange at first seeing that everything's built from arpeggios which are generally not under our hands as guitar players that well they're really awkward things for us to navigate but you know it teaches us about horn language and how it's built uh, and that's really great to see as well uh, I think there's there's another great story of like Michael Brecker as well when he when he was trying to get a lot of he was a saxophone player I should mention Michael Brecker was trying to get a lot of pop gigs as well to just to to be able to maintain a living really and just and live in new york early in his career and so he said he found himself transcribing a lot of electric guitar parts because when it came to writing melodies that worked in 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 the pop kind of circle it was really useful to draw on that material and to to hear music from that perspective it's, it's very cool i think there's um i think there's like a there's an interview as well he does like a tutorial it's really cool with his like big 80s glasses as well. It's quite funny to see, but he does a tutorial in an interview where he talks about specifically doing that and the benefits from it. But from that side of things, it was really cool to hear that that you had another instrument that transcribed the guitar and what that kind of sounds like. But yeah, I hope that answers that then. So, oh, there's some interesting ones here. Oh, they are hotting up. So we have uh, what to do when awesome licks turn into compulsive habits you struggle to avoid. Oh, okay. So what do we do when we have a bunch of licks under our hands, but when it comes to improvising, that's all that we can use and we start to get sick of it? Well, I talk about this a lot with, with private students as well. And I find that it's often about being a little more meticulous with the material that you have. It's not that the material that you have is boring or that it sounds, you know, drawn out or whatever it is. It may be that we only have kind of one way of thinking of it right now. So I know a lot of people kind of use like, uh, I can't remember what the phrase is. It's like where you take a cell and then you change every other note in that cell until your cell becomes basically a brand new cell. But being a bit more meticulous and being a bit more curious with the material that you have. So my advice would be take just one of those lines that you have, one of those licks, whatever it may be. And you could do a few things with it. For for one, you could... You could um, you could see what that line would sound like if you played it a quaver later or an eighth note later, basically, and keep pushing along a bar until it's kind of two quavers later, it's three quavers later, it's happening on, you know, the one, the and of one, two, the and of two. And so the emphasis of that line sort of changes as well. That allows you to at least hear that one idea rhythmically from a different place because you're highlighting it uh, from a different kind of perspective as well, which, which may be one um, answer for you. Another thing as well, I, I do this quite a lot. I think it's a really it's a really interesting way to expand 
the language and also the usage of your line. Take a line that you've got, just a simple line, and this is a harmonic idea. Take that line and see if you can apply it. Let's say your line right now is in G major. It's a line that you have in G major. Um, I'm not going to sing it either because <laughs> I'm not warmed up. I'm none of those things right now. So if you took your line in G major, what would that sound like in G Dorian? What notes would you have to change? What happens if the chord changes and you were to try to use that same line? And then the same is true for applying it to G Phrygian as well. If you were to rearrange some of the notes there, how would that same same line work? And sometimes it can be about changing one note. Sometimes it could be about changing two or three notes to really make it fit. And do the same thing for Lydian and Mixolydian and et cetera, into Aeolian and Locrian as well. And what you should come out with is, hopefully if your line is diverse enough in note content, you'll, you'll find that the lines that you have that start in G major, you, you end up with maybe like seven different lines, which is quite interesting as well. So taking a modal approach to lines as well by just changing notes at a time is a really good way to, to think of it. There are obviously a whole slew of other ideas that you can use to even just mix up those lines that you have as well. You could use octave displacement. You could put kind of simple where you would normally have a note, put a pause in there. Um, you could try and kind of change up the rhythm to those things as well. But also I do feel that when I feel stale in the material that I'm using, I always know it's an indication I have to, again, and I know we kind of talked about this answer already, but I have to go off and listen to other stuff. I have to either go and transcribe a line that I'm interested in, just sit with it for a few days and then try to create something else out of it, try to use that material and factor into my playing as well. But yeah, it's quite easy for us to drift into compulsive habits. And there is something in this as well that like compulsive habits or lines that feel like compulsive habits, they can feel like a bad thing. Immediately we go, oh man, I'm just recycling the same, same material. But there is also another side to that as well. There's a side to that that says, perhaps you're actually clued up and comfortable with the material that you have and that it's not compulsive or boring or whatever it is, then actually you're really comfortable with using it. And so the next step is actually not to say I've mastered it and move on to something new. It's to say, great, I, I know it in its current form, but how can I change it and continue to manipulate one piece of, 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 of language or a phrase into more information? And so I, I often do this as well. I don't have it handy, but I have like a little black book that I use. I transcribe little lines that I work on. And yeah, I change up rhythms for them. I change up the general feel of them, the architecture of them as well. And it keeps me really busy. I've been doing it with the, the diminished scale recently, working on some cells for that as well. So just kind of shifting things each time. And it gives you some really cool ideas to, to, to work with. And what you find as well, like the more meticulous that you work with, with the material that you have, I tend to find that that spills over to everything else that you look at. So I found that when I started to like 12 key my lines, for example, I started to want to 12 key tunes as well and then try to 12 key whether it was bebop heads as well. Or how can I understand Donna Lee or Stomping at the Savoy, whatever it is, in a different key? What if it's in D flat or what if it's in F or, or whatever? So you'll find that that meticulous nature, when applied to one thing, will often kind of bunny hop into the other areas of music that you're interested in as well. It's quite, it's quite fun that way. And often, you know, you realize, wow, the world of music just got so much bigger. There's so much else to work on. So on that, I would say dig into your curiosities a little bit more. See what else you can do with that one line. I hope that's helpful. So on to the final few questions. What have we got here? Ooh, what are your musical hot takes? So, okay, so I actually had to make some notes on this one. <laughs> um, I'm not going to go into a big diatribe or complain about anything course not but musical hot takes I think this is a um, this is a funny one I'm I should say as well I'm speaking on behalf of me for this as well so these are just my personal hot takes that I find um, are true I suppose to me uh, but I'll, I've, I've noted down three here and perhaps you know if you disagree with them tell me why you disagree with them I want to know put them in the comments um, at me <laughs> so my first musical hot take uh, cue like the fire emoji my first musical hot take is that there is a there's a branch of people who they specifically stay away from music theory. I heard Josh Smith talking about this. It's from an older video of his. It's it's really cool as well. If you don't know Josh Smith, really great blues guitarist who seems to kind of dive into all sorts of music like Motown, bits of jazz as well, some really cool stuff. 
But I heard him address this and I thought, yeah, I think I agree with that. And the general, the general idea is that there's a group of musicians that really, they stay away from this idea of going down the theory rabbit hole or learning any theory at all. And it's the fear that if your ear is too educated or it's too kind of clued up on theory, that it stops you being inherently creative. Now, that's a bit of a pet peeve of mine because I know, again, even just having given the answer that I'd, I'd given about kind of changing one line, I know that when you start to learn pieces of music theory, it can be really, really useful for giving yourself new ideas. Of course, the premise always exists, and this is why there's two sides to the coin. Your ear always wants to lead where, you, where it is you want to go, whether that's from an improvisational standpoint or you know composition. Of course, your ear always wants to guide where you want to go. But I would say that you rarely struggle with a problem or a roadblock when you have more information. I th I'd say that's generally true. So, um, yeah, I, 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 t I tell you the common one as well. And there's, I'm sure there are teachers that, that hear this either every week, like I do, or just in, in, in general kind of passing with students is I often hear the idea of I want to break out of the boxes or I want to kind of expand past what else can I do with the pentatonic scale or this scale or whatever. That's the general premise that a lot of students who become curious then about, you know, playing different styles of music, that's how they frame it, which is I want to break outside of this box. And it's not to say that um, there are certain people who want to remain in the box, but it is, I think, to say that when you become curious about more sophisticated music that, that uses that uses perhaps its harmony or its melody or its rhythm in a different way, I always think it's worth digging into because you really don't understand when you open up the door to all of that stuff, man it gets so much bigger the world of music and there's there's so much more to dig into as well so that would be my first hot take um again let me know if you disagree with it if you do that's that's fine i want to hear from you though put some in the comment section call me out um okay so my next musical hot take oof this is going to touch some nerves um i think there are too many educators on youtube that are concerned with clickbait content and their approach to quality education is inherently dishonest. So this is something that I've thought about this one for quite a while. And again, it's something I hear from a lot of students and they share with me stuff that they're learning from. Again, I'm not, I'm not going to call out any names or channels or anything like that. But when I go to watch stuff, I get a really, I get this kind of like feeling of, of, of watching um, an educational content whether it's a guitar lesson or it's a theory lesson or whatever it is and I can see that the entire lesson is designed to just be skin deep it's designed to give you just a small small modicum of something um, but it's that it's not really useful at the end of the day I think there's too much click baiting um, that's really used to kind of bolster people's channels and their and their presence online but when you actually dig into the material that they're saying again this could just be me because I like being meticulous I like being detailed in things but I quickly find that you can lead students down a rabbit hole of actually complete confusion if you don't if you don't truly take um, time to really break down a subject. I think I think that's quite a big one as well. Uh, but I don't know. For me, at least, it's something that I see quite a lot. There's such a volume and a, and a surplus of information out there at the moment that I don't know. I think you you are going to have bad quality education in there as well. Um, but yeah, that's my hot take. So my final hot take then is. Higher education is rarely a good reflection of how the music industry or how the music scene works. You might be listening to this either coming off the back of higher education, whether that's this year, 10 years ago, whatever, or perhaps you might be hearing this just going into higher education music. I, again, I am, I am framing this as my own opinion. This is just what I think. Um, I would say that, yeah, music, the music scene is very, very different to how music is taught. And I think there's always, look, this is always the case whenever you create a syllabus. It's like, it's always going to be slightly outdated from what's happening in the present. Because you're creating something that hopefully, you know, that you can use for a year, two years, five years. And in that time, music changes, education changes, the scene changes, you know, whatever it is, the industry changes. And I think to a large part, there are a lot of musicians that come out and feel, um, they feel that they're very highly skilled musicians, but they feel that the music scene doesn't interact with the way that they maybe were told that it interacts or they find it difficult to find work that's not within the circles that they that they that they work in um 
yeah, I, I, I don't want to go too much further into it because I know that it could launch into quite a big, um, quite a big kind of topic. But it's something that we've talked about very loosely as well on on sitting in before. You'll find this like a few episodes back talking about is it worth going to music school? I believe um, there are great things. Don't get me wrong. There's great things about music school. You meet all these interesting people, creative people. You meet some really great tutors as well. You get the opportunity to really expand. Um, but I think when it comes to like the business side of things as well and setting up as a uh, as a business, because that's what every musician, unfortunately, is. That's, we don't work for free. <laughs> it's what we do. So there isn't a whole lot of information there, I would say. Um, and then when it comes to kind of creating contacts and that sort of thing, you realize actually that the importance of shedding is, yeah, it's very important, sure. But the importance of shedding good relationships, as it were, or like, you know, trying to meet people, network, that sort of thing. That's a really important um, skill to also have. So on to then the final question. Um, I need to remind myself to like take a big breath as well because <laughs> I've been now talking for like 30 minutes continuously. But hopefully this is enjoyable so far. I'm having a lot of fun. So the final question I have here is I've moved to Edinburgh, lost all of my musical connections and gigs and had to get a normal job. Any advice? Well, first I would say that I think I think Edinburgh's got a great music scene. But it really depends what it is that you're looking for. Are you looking to be a musician? Are you looking to sack in your regular nine to five job? Are you, you know, are you really serious about doing it? Because if you're not, it's fine as well. Thinking about this one, I think the answer is always networking with this. I know I've kind of just said that in a previous answer, but I think the answer is always networking. When I moved up to the Midlands after studying in London, I was actually in a very similar situation of being like, what do I do? How do I create work? How do I create connections? How do I do any of this? And I would say, I think the the first thing that you can do really is, is reach out to people that you hear, whether it's like pub bands or whether it's people at conservatoires and music schools near you, events, that kind of thing, and get to know people. Find them on Facebook, probably don't stalk them or Instagram or whatever. Create connections that way as well. I think what you find is is just generally true with with creative circles is that I would say it's actually pretty easy to break into creative circles. It's really just about being there, showing your support for music, for a scene, for a jam, whatever it is, and just working your way slowly there. I think the general truth of like the more that people see you, the more that you start to become kind of the furniture of the scene, which is, you know, it's a good thing to be as well. So I did things like um, I took lessons with people. I took lessons with um, players around here, uh, teachers that I knew were already established well before me, all kinds of things. I, I reached out to people to hang, you know, whatever it is, or just kind of bounce ideas off as well. And from that, I think you start to get an understanding of music being kind of a community in that way. So I would say, yeah, just step by step, go out and meet people, try to, try to, yeah, gather some, gather some experience that way as well. But if you're somebody that's, um, that's already musical and you've got experience of gigs and that sort of thing as well, I think it's always worth trying to almost start music as a bit of a side hustle until it becomes your your main your main uh your main kind of income as it were so yeah i would say advertise yourself let it be known that you're somebody with musical connections or or whatever it is you know utilize those things as well set up get get online get talking to people make sure that people know your name and i think what happens is throughout uh throughout enough time people just start to realize that yeah you you, you live here you you're in the scene you support the music whatever it is, you know, it's really, it's really good to do. So the answer is always, yeah, build community from, from wherever you can ground up. And I think you'll find it kind of works out for you that way as well. But yeah, Edinburgh is a really great scene and it's, it's kind of frustrating kind of not living in Edinburgh because my two other hosts, Reese and Callum, obviously they live in Edinburgh. They are, um, Edinburghers. I hope that's the right term. It sounds like the right term and it's a really good term if it is, <laughs> but I'm sure, you know, if you, if you wanted to reach out to them, I'm sure that they could give you a lot more um, advice as well, just about finding your feet with the scene as well. But yeah, anyway, I have been running now for just over half an hour, but I am going to wrap it up. And I just want to say, yeah, if you are, if you're still with me at this point in the, uh, in, in, in the episode, then thank you. Yeah. Thank you for being with me. It's been really interesting to do this. Um, it's been a really fun experience as well. I didn't realize I could talk so long, so quickly, <laughs> but yeah, it's very cool. So join us next time for, I, I think this is episode 17 coming up. I may be wrong. Who knows? There may be a correction somewhere in the works. 
Um, but yes, it's been very good. I hope this has been insightful to you. And again, I want to hear from you people, you listeners, you musicians in the comments section. If you disagree with me, if you agree with me, whatever, I'd love to hear it. Um, and again, you can help the podcast and support the podcast either by buying us a coffee in the link below or by sharing the episodes as well. We really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I suppose that's all she wrote today. So yes, thank you very much. And we will see you in the next episode. Bye.